Let's welcome our guests as they come and bring in the word of God. Chris, I'll hand that to you. Amen. Amen. I uh, appreciate your kind words. Actually, uh, I'm going to share for a bit, and then my wife is going to share because uh, we like to keep it equal. Amen? Some people think my wife can't talk, so I'm going to let her preach. Well, it is a pleasure for us to be here. Uh, we love you guys. You've been, impacted our life, like, well, when I got born again, and then instrumental in our marriage, and just your example of serving God always, so it's encouraging for us. Amen? I was going to sing a special number. <laughs> But then Pastor David said he wants to triple the people. He wants to grow the church. So, no, you have never heard me sing, so put that hand down. Yeah? Or are you casting the devil out? I don't know. What? Piano man? Billy Joel? Anybody want to hear some Billy Joel? Anyway, uh, yeah, it is a, a joy for us to be here. Um, we love Canada. The more we're out of it, the more we love it, if that makes sense. To realize that we do live in the best, or I guess we don't live here, but we are... This is the best country in the world. It really is. And we can celebrate diversity as we do in this church. The right kind of diversity. Amen? So, yeah, I don't know what you guys between Regina and Moose Jaw are doing with uh, your roads. I almost lost my dad's car in a pothole. <clears throat> I've been to third world countries that have better roads than Moose Jaw. True story. True story. Yeah, Moose Jaw. I thought maybe there a war broke out and America dropped bombs and nobody told us. There's, yeah, there's huge craters in the street. But anyway, it is a joy for us to be here. Uh, we came here actually for my daughter's graduation. She graduated on Friday, 18 years old. I know it's hard to believe that a guy like me could be almost 40. But uh, it's true. So we're excited about this season of our life, and we're excited about this church and uh, how this church is, well, just you guys personally have always been supportive of us, uh, no matter what we do, and especially on the mission field. And uh, we always see it, uh, what we do overseas, as a, as a part of an extension of the local church, not just Chris and Tab. But, you know, this church and, you know, the church in Moose Jaw and with the Murphys as well, that just the, the love and the support that goes with us. And as, you know, it's, it's all of our deal, not just us. So everybody that gives and prays and, and thinks about us, you know, you guys claim that as well. The nations. Amen? Yeah, it is, it is very humbling for us as missionaries to, uh, you know, a lot of what we do is, uh, you know, a result of what people give and you know it is humbling you come and yeah we need your money and you know this kind of stuff and it is humbling because people sacrifice a lot to to keep us on the field to allow us to do what God's called us to do so you know we're very grateful and appreciative of, of that amen so thank you very much and uh, we'll share more in detail at the luncheon kind of the things that are happening in Asia. But uh, we do have a, a new magazine that we produce in Thailand called Continuum. This is all done by our missionaries and students. And uh, we have an amazing media department. We also produce a TV show uh, with the same name, uh, WM Continuum. You can check that out on YouTube. But we want to give one of these free for 20 bucks. No, I'm just kidding. For free, uh, we have a whole bunch. I don't want to leave any in my dad's basement because he'll... Uh, I don't know what he'll do with them, but he'll throw them out maybe. So, yeah, we'll give these out to everybody. So it just kind of gives you an idea of what's happening in the different nations. We are working in 10 different nations now, and we are expanding. Uh, we expanded this year into Rwanda, which is not really in our area, Southeast Asia. But we had a student came from Rwanda, studied two years. We trained him, so we claimed him. And I will be heading into Rwanda this year, which is exciting. I've never been to Africa, so a lot of things happening. India, amazing things. I actually spent a lot more time in India, Pakistan, than ever before. And uh, like your mission bulletin today, Bangladesh was the highlight mission country. We'll be doing some work there this year, so that's a new nation for us as well. And just exciting things. We'll share more. Like I said, I don't want to steal my own thunder, right? My Great Commission Destiny. Okay, everybody has a part to play in the Great Commission. Amen? Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. It was a command, not a suggestion, a commandment. So everybody has a responsibility in the Great Commission. For some of us, that might be over the ocean, 
Some of us, that might be over the street, right? For some of us, that might be on the other side of your kitchen table. Amen? But we all have a part to play in the Great Commission, right? The responsibility is on us. Amen? So this morning, as my wife, she's going to predominantly preach here, but we want to appeal to your sense of destiny this morning, okay? Because God has something for you in the kingdom. There is something for every person to do in the kingdom of God. Every person in this place today, whether you think highly of yourself or you think you're a dog, forget about that. God has a place for you in the kingdom of God. Amen? You ever make a puzzle and there's a piece missing? Doesn't matter what piece it is, it ruins the puzzle, right? We are all pieces in the puzzle of the kingdom of God. And without every piece doing something, it's incomplete. Amen? Yeah, so yeah, we want to appeal to you this morning with that. Just encourage you that God has something for your life, no matter where you are, what you're doing, whether it's working in a factory or working on the other side of the world, or you're raising your kids at home, it's, it's a vital part of the kingdom of God. It's a vital part of the Great Commission. Amen? Amen. So everybody has a part to play. Okay, I feel like I want to preach, but... I'll stop myself because I want to hear my wife preach. She's an excellent preacher, but uh, we'll, I'll share more at the luncheon and we'll do some more in detail kind of stuff. Keep you guys accountable to what we are doing. Lots of exciting things happening, lots of new nations, lots of just people just rising up into their Great Commission destiny. And, uh, you know, we've kind of come with a bit of a side agenda. We've come for your children. <laughs> Amen to the greatest Bible school in the world. And I don't just say that. It is the greatest Bible school that I've experienced. And uh, we have the greatest teachers come from all over the world. We have the, some of the top guys in Victory come, and they spend two weeks with the students. And one day, my desire is to get Pastor David to come and teach in Thailand. Amen? Yeah, really. So, if, I mean, he's got other places in the world he could go. Maybe Thailand could be one of those. But yeah, so kids, if you're, if you're thinking about Bible school, maybe in the fall you're done school, this is the greatest Bible school in the world. It's like a quarter of the price you would pay to go anywhere in Canada, and that includes your airplane ticket, and you get to ride elephants, and you get to eat Thai food, amen? In Thailand, we don't call it Thai food, we just call it food, Right? <laughs> But yeah, it's exciting. And this could be, I went to this Bible school after we went to Bible school in Moose Jaw. I went to this Bible school and my life was changed forever. Just God gave me a, a picture of, of the nations. He gave me a picture of just people in the world that are, you know, crying out for purpose, crying out for destiny, crying out for Christ. And I mean, we've seen some amazing things. We've been shot at, you know, blown up stoned, and that was all just in Pakistan in one afternoon. So, I mean, hey, we've seen a lot of things. I mean, we've <laughs> preached on mountains with the students, take them into the villages, some of the most remote places in the world, and they've never heard of Jesus Christ, but they know who David Beckham is. <laughs> and that, that's kind of sad, you know, really? Who is Jesus? I don't know. But did you know David Beckham scored a goal? What? And they, 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 they don't know. So they, what an amazing opportunity. And we take our students all over uh, Thailand through the jungles, you know, and we started a new program which is going to allow the students to, after they complete a year or so, to go into work as an intern in some of the other nations that we have Bible schools. So this year we opened up, in the last couple of years, four Bible schools, India, Nepal, uh, Burma will be starting this year, and last year we opened up our Rwanda Bible School, and we have a Bible school in Fairview, Manila. If you like Jollibee, you can go to the Philippines, and yeah, it's amazing. So yeah, think about that, young people. If you're, uh, you think about it, you get one of these magazines, give you all the information, we'll stay here after and talk, but we really want to encourage everybody. You know, they're not just for young people, but for anybody. Do something for the Lord Jesus, amen? We get one shot at this. Let's make it a good one. Yeah. All right. So now I'm going to call up my lovely wife. She's going to, she's going to preach down here. And uh, yeah, she's a great preacher, great wife, great mother. 
great cook, great folderer of laundry. <laughs> Amen. You won't see that on a card. You won't. Hi. Well, Wilson was just saying that uh, he's going to lose his youth that next Sunday or whatever, or the boot camp. But we're taking two of your youth that I saw on the worship team today to Bible school. So, uh, as he says, mature worship team, you guys better rise up because we're taking them. And I'm excited about it. I get to work a lot with the worship team in Thailand. And this next year, we're actually going to launch a lot more into the nations. And we're going to be traveling to train up in the nations like Burma and India. Um, we're going to be doing camps and workshops with them. And it's really an exciting time because worship is really powerful and it's really instrumental. And it really does break things open in the nations. So the opportunity to head into these nations and take our students with us is like... I don't, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity for these kids. And so we're really excited at what's going to happen. And you got a couple guys coming, and I already see where they're going to be. <laughs> so, Johan, even if you wanted to go and do something else, I'm going to make you be on the worship team. What is it? God has a plan for you, and so do I. So it's perfect. Um, Pastor David, no, my husband mentioned that Pastor David and, and Tara have been instrumental in our lives, and they have been, and, and actually, I, we're probably married because of them. Um, still married because of them. Because, you know what was funny is uh, my husband was a little bit dragging his heels, I guess, and I remember Pastor David saying to, to Chris, you better figure out this girl can't wait around forever. <laughs> And uh, I got a phone call from Pastor David. Pastor David said, Chris is going to propose to you. <laughs> Do you remember? <laughs> it's true. He did. I was sick, and he came and proposed to me. And uh, I'm pretty sure Pastor David held him down and then said, you better do this. <laughs> but we're happy, so it's all good. <laughs> but it was really funny. They've been so instrumental in our lives, and we just thank you guys. We just love you guys. We're so proud of what we see here in your kids and this ministry. I said to my dad, there's such a sweet presence in this place. And we go to a lot of places, and I can tell you there's not the presence of God. You know, but we see that we feel and we see the presence of God here. And when I came to, uh, when we came to Canada about a month ago, I was sitting in my room and I was reading the word and this word came to me. And when Chris said to me, do you want to preach? I felt that this word was for you guys. So I'm going to share today just from 2 Corinthians 10. If you want to just turn in your Bibles there. I just want to talk today because the church is under attack and things are not going to get easier for the church. We are in a day and time where people are getting further and further away from God. Even people who claim to be Christians, they're not shining brighter, they're not uh, becoming more effective, they're not ministering, they're getting weaker, and we need to shine brighter, right? You look at the TV, or you read the newspaper, or you go online, and there's constant turmoil everywhere. There's people who are aborting their babies. There's people who are, um, you know, killing other people, school shootings and stabbings and everything like crazy right now around the world. The world is not getting to be a safer place, right? This time in the season that we're in, I mean, even if you guys have read Thailand's back into a coup again, the world is unstable. But as Christians, we need to be stable, right? We need to be the people who stand on a foundation and are not moved by the things that we see in the world. Because when things get worse, and we know just from the word of God it will, it's not going to get better, then the Christians have to. We have a responsibility for Christ to shine brighter and be more effective as ministers of the gospel. And when you see or you hear the politician who, Justin Trudeau, just mentioned to his political party that if you didn't believe in abortion, right, and you didn't believe in same-sex marriage, then you maybe need to rethink the Liberal Party. If you support the Liberal Party, I would not support them anymore. Right? We're not, we're not playing around. We're not joking. We're not kidding. This isn't a game. We can't be like the world. 
We have to be set apart. And if we're set apart, it means we actually look different than the world. Right? But here's the problem. The battle that we're in, most people are not prepared for. Most Christian people say they're ready, but when the door, when they get a knock on their door, they're not ready. When their kids turn upside down, they're not ready. When their bank book is empty, they're not ready. Right? It's easier when your kids are upside down just to yell at them some more or, you know, send them to their room or, you know, your bank book's empty. Well, I'm just going to save more. I'm going to keep more. Right? It's easier. Why would I go and spend time with my son who's upside down in a ditch when he doesn't even respect me? But I tell you, we see in Thailand a lack of parental role models, parents who aren't parenting, and their kids are left to the vices of the world. And that will not be our son, I tell you that. And it will not be the youth that come to our Bible college. But that means we have a responsibility, and we need to be prepared. We can't just stand and blend into the world, right? If somebody comes at you and talks about abortion, do you be quiet? Now that doesn't mean you have to go and pick it in front of City Hall, and it doesn't mean that you paint dead babies on a big poster. I'm not saying that. That is not effective. But effective is when the light of Christ shines through you so that the world can see you. Effective is when people who are broken and hurting and have families that are upside down and have finances that are an issue, when they come to you because they see something different in you. But what's happening is that the blending of Christianity in the world is getting to be too frequent. And we see too many churches that have no life and no light. Too many Christians that are dead men walking. Right? You see them, and they get up, and they say, I love Jesus, but they don't show it. Their life is in shambles. They're a mess. They can't get out of debt. They're constantly sick. Their kids are upside down. They don't know what the Word of God says to them, so they can't fight with the Word of God. And it makes them ineffective, and it makes them a very poor example for Christ. Because we should be people that when they see us, they're just coming to us. They want to know what's going on. You're being watched whether you realize it or not. If you've ever said you're a Christian to somebody, they're watching you. You might not realize it, but they're watching you. I know for us in Thailand, they watch us all the time. They want to see what the white people are doing. Sorry to use that term, but it's true. We're pretty pasty. And they want to see what we're doing all the time. And when I first um, came home with Ephraim and I would take him into the mall, people loved watching us together, me and Ephraim. But if I left him at home, because everybody knows us, because we have the very white baby. If I would go to the mall and I wouldn't bring my kid, they would be like, where's your son? I'd say, oh, he's home with his dad. Is that okay? I'm like, he's a parent. Shouldn't it be okay? It just shocked them that my husband would be willing to parent his own child. That I would trust him and leave my son with him was beyond their imagination. And they would just be shocked because that's just not normal. But being different, part of what we, like part of our ministry in Thailand is to set a standard in our marriage and with our son. Because it's so upside down over there with sexual perversion and parents who don't parent and just marriages that are in shambles that we don't want that. We want to be different. We want to be set apart. And in our village where we live, we have this man that, lived, that lives across the street with his young family. And we didn't know we were being watched by him. We met him, we had a um, village barbecue kind of thing, but it was just bring your own potluck sort of thing. And we went over and he said, oh, hi, you guys are the God people. <laughs> and I never talked to this guy one minute in my life. And he said, I watch you guys, you guys have people coming in and out of your house all the time. You guys must know so many people. And since then, now it's opened up a relationship with that guy, and we talk to him. He speaks excellent English, which we never knew because he never talked to us before. It happens all the time to us. They don't want to talk to us until they, you know, can trust us, I guess. I don't know. But 
there are people are watching you. And we never said a single thing to that guy about who we were, but obviously other people have said stuff about what we do. And people pay attention to what you say. And when you say you're a Christian, because of the world being so upside down, they want to see something different. They need to see something different. We see Christians all around the world falling, whether it's sexual sin or money or just lusts or desires, they get off track. And I mean, we've come home and run into people that were on fire for God and they're not serving God anymore. It's really sad. You know, you see TV evangelists and people on TV all the time. And that is what the world perceives Christianity as a lot of times. They see the TV and they see the preachers on TV. And then when they fall, they think, ah, all Christians are like that. Right? They know a Christian and the Christian falls into sin and then they're like, well, all Christians are like that. They're just hypocrites. So now more than ever before, with the world being in such disarray, we as Christians have to rise up. And we have to be different. Because if we're not set apart, they have nothing to run to. And when they're in doubt and in distress, like David's men were, they want to come to somebody who can lead them and help them. And that's going to come when you actually shine your light and you actually become different. We don't want to get into the habit of counseling people with the things of this world. Right? We're not going to counsel somebody to have a divorce. Do you understand? There's a lot of people in Christian circles that will just say, we'll get a divorce. That is not biblical. You need to know your word. And you need to be ready to counsel people the way the word of God says and not the way the world says. It's too blended. But we have a responsibility to know the word of God. So let's read 2 Corinthians 10. It's Paul talking, and this is one of his churches, and he's, he loves his churches. It says, By the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you, I, Paul, who am timid when with you face to face, but bold when away. Oh, timid when, yeah, bold when face to face. I beg that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world, on the contrary, they have the divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Paul was in his own time here, but he was still facing the same battles. These guys who were facing the battles of the world, but they were fighting with the weapons of the world. And what's going to make you successful today? It's actually picking up the weapons that are of the spiritual realm and not of the worldly realm. Right? When you're having endless fights with your kids and your spouse and your boss, fighting back with them is a worldly tool. Prayer is a spiritual tool. Right? When your finances are upside down and you're afraid that you're not going to have enough, hoarding your money is a worldly tool. But giving your money is a spiritual tool. And that's how you're going to become effective. You're going to become effective by actually picking up the weapons that God wants us to fight with. Okay? Because when we try to fight like the world fights, we're beating at the air. Right? And if we want to actually be effective, we want to have a full arsenal to go into war with. Because if you're going into war with your fists and they're coming at you with tanks and guns and you're not going to win the war. But if you go in with the best weaponry possible, bazookas and whatever else, I don't even know it's good, then you're going to win. Right? The enemy becomes powerless. So we need to know how to fight. If we don't fight like the world, then we have to figure out how to fight like the king, right? Because we know that there's two battles that are, that are, there's two forces at battle, right? There's the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. So what we need to realize is we're not fighting against flesh and blood. The battle is not the person next to you. Even when you're in the midst of a battle with your kids, your kid isn't the enemy that you're trying to fight. 
They might feel like it. You may want to spank them, send them to their room, uh, kick them out the door, whatever, because they're so frustrating. But they're not your battle. The battle is something that's going on in the spiritual realm. And so our eyes have to be able to see into the spiritual realm. Our ears have to be able to hear what's happening in the spiritual realm so that we're able to be effective to fight in the spiritual realm. Because if you can't see it, it can sneak in and attack you. But if you're in tune to the things of God and to the ways of God, then it can't sneak attack you because you're ready. And one of the best ways to be ready is to know who you're fighting. Because you can waste a lot of time. I mean, I've done it. I'm sure all of you have done it. You can waste a lot of time fighting people and things that you see. But your problem isn't money. Your problem isn't your spouse. Your problem is the things that battle and wage war against your marriage and against your finances. You hear me? So when you feel like your spouse, you want to divorce your spouse... That's the enemy at work, behind the scenes. It's not your spouse that's turned out to be this horrible person. You love them at one point, I assume, if you married them. You need to be on guard. We have a problem when we use the world's tools in battle. And the problem is we become just like the world. We don't have any one up on them, right? We have no, we're not stronger than them. Right? It puts us on the same level field as the world. And that makes us ineffective. Right? Our, a lot of times our natural response is to respond with the worldly weapons. And we want to, you know, fight the person right in front of us. Sometimes you just need to close your mouth and walk away. And that's really hard for people. Right? Sometimes you need to let your kids go. And make their own decisions. And that can be really hard for people because our natural instincts lean towards the flesh and the things of the world. And we have to be quick to be people who think of the things of the spirit instead of the things of the world. Right? We can't be people who rely on our talents and our strengths and our beauty and our money or, you know, the things the world relies on. Hollywood's not looking to Jesus. We're looking to Hollywood. Why? Is Angelina Jolie going to, you know, help you get out of hell? Is she going to help your marriage? I doubt it. She committed adultery. So why do we look to the things of the world to help us and aid us? We're not going to get anything from them. If we're battling the same battle as them, we're ineffective. It says here that our weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world, right? But on the contrary, they have divine power. Divine power means it's supernatural. We're not picking up the things of the world, but we're picking up things that are in the spirit. So we've got prophetic, which means I could walk up to any of you, and if God gave me a word, I could read your mail right now and be more effective in five minutes than, than anything else could be. But it's a supernatural thing, right? Right? I could be led by the Spirit to go to a friend and bring a, a meal, and it's perfectly timed because they had no more food. And it's because I'm led by the Spirit. The Spirit of God will lead you to the places where the darkness is to shine the light. Amen. Right? You'll go to the marriages that are upside down and in a ditch because God led you to those people. You'll go to the places that, that other people are afraid to go to because Christ's light shines through you. And you'll see that the darkness has to flee in the midst of the light. But it's because of the divine weapon that we use. Not because we're anybody. I'm nothing without Christ. And you're nothing without Christ. But if you have Christ and you're willing to use the arsenal that he's given you, man, you guys can destroy so much in the city. You guys can break down strongholds that you never even imagined. And no more does it have to be, you know, people looking at Christianity and wondering, oh, you know, are they hypocrites or whatever. But people are just flocking to the churches that are Bible preaching, teaching. Because we have to be the light on the hill. And we have to be different. And if we fight with weapons that make us effective, then we are different. 
right? Our marriages thrive. Our children are excellent. People wonder why we have the house we have. Let me tell you, we have a house that we never should have. But it's only because of our obedience and because of God's blessing. And many of you are in that boat. And you know, if, if people want to see a difference, there has to be something that's different. It can't just be because you say you're different. Right? Does that make sense? Divine weapons will accomplish what worldly weapons can't. So when you're having issues in your life and you got struggles and you got stuff that needs to break down, you go to it with worldly weapons, it's not going to be effective. You go with spiritual weapons and divine weapons and it will come down. Whatever stronghold you're dealing with. But here's the key. We the part of our weaponry is that we actually have to fight against the arguments and the ideas that rise up against God. Right? We get so caught up sometimes in fighting things that are just elementary. You know, oh, the skirt length is too short. Oh, you know, that, that school has, you know, um, a few too many issues. Whatever. What we need to realize is that you have to start changing the ideas that people have, the arguments that people have, right? The battle starts in people's minds. And when you can start changing people's thoughts and what they think towards something, then you can change them. But you can't argue with somebody. I mean, we've tried. I mean, Chris gets into, you know, debates. I won't call them arguments. With, what? What? Yeah, some pretty good ones with people. But if they won't change their thinking, they won't change. Right? But if you can change somebody's thinking, you can totally rehabilitate them. You can totally help them out of their addiction. You can help them on their marriage, and you can help them in their life. Because they've opened up their thought process to stand against what the world says and line it with the Word of God. And that will make them successful. Right? And when it, what it comes down to is that you guys have to look at yourself. Because I can try to change Chris all I want, but I'll be way more effective if I change myself first. Right? And I have to make sure my thinking is lined up with the Word of God before I make sure your thinking is lined up with the Word of God. I want to make sure I'm as effective as I can be. And so that means I have a responsibility to be ready for battle. And the only way that I can be ready for battle is to prepare myself. And the best ways that I can think of to prepare myself is obviously one, being in the word. Washing your mind with the word. You know, if... if uh, something comes on you and something comes at you and it's contrary to the word of God, you won't know it if you don't know the word of God. You won't. If you're a teenager and you get pregnant and somebody comes and says to you, this is going to, you know, affect the rest of your life, then they take you to the abortion clinic and you just do it because everybody's doing it. You don't know. The truth is what will set you free. And the truth can only be found in actually knowing what the Word of God says. And so we have a responsibility to be in the Word. If I get sick, if I, get, if I am lacking in finances, what does the Word of God say about those things? If I want to overcome my own battles that are going on in my mind, I need to wash it with the Word. And I need the Word to be the truth that prevails in my mind so that when things come against me, I'm not going to the worldly thought process, but I'm going to the spiritual world process because our flesh is waging against us and it just wants you to do what it wants you to do. So it's not naturally going to come under um, your authority and, and back down unless you actually have something that's stronger to overcome it. And for some people, you're just too lazy to read the word of God. And you think that other things are more important. But there's nothing more important than knowing what's in your word. 
I'll tell you, I've been through some pretty amazing, well, not, I wouldn't say amazing, <laughs> pretty overwhelming things in my life. And I, I'll say, if I did not have the foundation of the word of God at work within me, I don't know if I would have made it. So having a foundation in the word of God will be instrumental in making you shine brighter and in being more effective and having a weapon that you can actually battle with. The other thing is to pray. It sounds so simple until you sit down to do it. But if you're seeking the Lord and you're listening to the Lord, not just talking to him, then he'll tell you when something's coming around the the path ahead and he'll warn you of when your kids are going to be upside down in a ditch and he'll give you the keys to the kingdom for you to unlock those doors and break down the strongholds that are going on in your life let me tell you we have a three-year-old and he thinks he's 20 and honestly we need the wisdom of God to raise him God gave him to us we know he's a gift from God he's our miracle but if we try to do it in our own strength that kid will be upside down because he's so strong he's got so many giftings on him but if we listen to what the voice of God says then we know that's a gift that's a strength you need to work on that and that is just pure outright rebellion <laughs> whereas right now it feels like it's all rebellion sometimes but God is the wisdom in it and going to him in prayer and seeking him and praying for your kids and praying for your spouse and praying for, you know, your boss and finances and any struggle that you're in will make you feel better, align you with Christ and give you the mind of Christ. You'll have the tools, you have that secret plan of attack, you know, that the people in military get, oh, here's our plan and we're going in and we're attacking from behind. You can totally attack the enemy without him even knowing and he'll be defeated. And it comes through prayer. The other thing, and this is what I love, your church is great with, worship. I love worship, and worship is one of those things where I can turn music on in the house and I'll just, you know, I can sing and just get lost in it. I just love it. It moves me. I don't, I don't know how people can't be moved in worship. It's just one of those things for me. But worship, if you have a bad day, if you, you feel like you're off track, if you turn on worship and you pay attention to what the words are and you align yourself with it, you'll find that it will just take you right back up to where your eyes are fixed on God. And the world is so distracting. And a lot of um, us get really caught up with Facebook or TV or the news or other things that take our eyes off of God. And getting your eyes back on God, whether, you know, it's worship or prayer or the word or all of them, I hope, will really help you guys to be very effective in the kingdom of God. We have a responsibility to be powerful because God is not a wimp. And with people looking at the church don't you want to be the church in the city that's known as the place of power and change? Yes. You want to be the people that when you say you're from Wellsprings, they go, oh man, I got I to gotta know what's going on there. I want to hear, you know, I want to be there. I've got to see, you know, Pastor David has a vision for a church that's, that seats three times, four times, five times, who knows how many times more than this, but it's not going to come just because he's different. It has to come because all of you are different. It has to come because all of you are being effective in your call. All of you are letting Christ shine brighter than the world in your life. Right? When you're at work, you're not one person and at home another person. When you're at church, you're not one person. And then when you're out with your friends, you're another person. We've seen too much of that. And it, it does breed hypocrisy. And people hate it. People want to see people who are set apart and who are different. People are led and drawn to people who stand out. They, they just are. I mean, you, you just even pray this week that you would influence somebody, just one person, and just try to be different. Walk around with a smile on your face because you love Jesus. You know, say hi to somebody. That almost shocks people nowadays. It doesn't seem like anybody greets anybody anymore on the street. But we want to be effective in the battle that we've been placed in. 
And that means we have to have discernment, guys, and we need to be in our words, and we need to know what we're battling against, and we need to stop fighting our brothers and our sisters in Christ. The church should be, shouldn't be a place of battle. The church, you shouldn't be grumbling and complaining against each other and stabbing each other in the back and fighting and backbiting at all. The church should be a place where people come and they get built up and they get encouraged and they get strengthened and they grow and they go out into the places where it's dark. There shouldn't be darkness in here. You need to remember that the battle is the Lord's and we walk beside him in it. And we want to be effective as the ambassadors of Christ. And I know, you know, your pastors, they love Jesus and and I mean, it, people can see it all over them. They're constantly talking about it. But what are, where are you at? Because your pastors aren't going to get you into heaven. Right? Your pastors aren't going to save your marriage. Your pastors aren't going to raise your kids. And your pastors aren't going to change your bank book. You're going to have to do that. And so you need to just stand up take your place in the army, prepare yourself for battle, and get your mind ready, because the world is gonna get dark. So you better shine bright. So I just, I just encourage you today just to really seek the Lord in the areas that you're feeling the enemy has a stronghold in your life and get the mind of Christ for it. Don't think like the world. If you have an area, you might not even know you have an area that you've let the world into in your thoughts, but um, God knows. So I encourage you just to go home and just ask the Lord, you know, if I let the world into my thinking somehow, am I doing something that the world does and it's not right? Am I thinking a way I shouldn't be thinking? Am I doing something I shouldn't be doing? And get ready for a battle. Because in the end, we win, right? We're the victors. But I want to be victorious here and not just in eternity. You know, I don't want to live in poverty. I don't want to live in sickness. I don't want to live in, in marital issues with my spouse. I want to love my spouse till we die. I want to be blessed so I can bless other people. So now's the time to change your thinking. Now's the time to get ready for battle and to rise up and take your place and go forth and change your city. Because you guys can do it and God hasn't been secretive about it. And you know the weapons you fight with. So it's your responsibility now to use those weapons and to become the most deadly army, as Chris would say, but it's really deadly, and kill anything that comes against the knowledge of Christ. Amen. Thanks, Pastor David. Amen. Can I have the worship team uh, just to come up here, Johanna and your team, and we're going to close it with one song, and then we'll pray. Because we have something else to do, praise God. Amen. We have something else to do. But I want to also uh, offer the opportunity, if you have a need, if you have a need and you need prayer, uh, I'm going to ask you to uh, come to the front and we're going to pray for you. If you have a prayer need, God is bigger than your need. Amen. God is bigger than your need. Hallelujah. Can we have that song? We will overcome. I, I just love that song. Why don't we all stand? Hallelujah. And you know, maybe you're here. Your greatest need is to know who Jesus Christ is. Are you born again? How many of you are born again? Can I see in your hand? You've given your life to Jesus and you know it. Hey? What if you are not? You know, if I'm you, if I'm not born again... I'll be running to the front right now. Because you know what? This is not a message for you to put it off and put it off. It is a message for you to embrace that the Lord Jesus Christ came to save sinners of whom I am chief. He came to save you for God so loved the world. God loves you and he has a plan for you. 
Unless you are born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. And I'm telling you, this is not something for you to turn away. This is something for you to embrace. If you are not born again, can I see your hand? Anybody that's not born again? Amen, amen. Those of you that are not born again and you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you're saying, I'm not ashamed of him. Could you walk to the front? You want to come right now, we'll pray for you. Okay. Whoever want to come and accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, hallelujah. You are not ashamed of him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You are not born again. And you want to accept the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. You come to the front and stand with her. Is that you are together? Is that your child? Oh, hallelujah. You are born again and your wife is giving her life to Jesus right now. Amen. Isn't that a great thing? Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 And we have our sister here. Amen. Why not we lift our hands to the Lord? Thank you, Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus.
May the Lord bless you. And if you want to stay and worship him, just worship him in Jesus' name.